All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to VSA Online. And uh, today, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Sam Wilson from uh, University of New South Wales. And uh, so it's uh, early morning uh, down there in Brisbane. So we will hear some fresh talk, fresh, fresh touch on HD, so to say. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Samuel, uh, please, the floor is, uh, floor is yours. Yep, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, can you see the screen? The slides are up. Let's make sure. Yes. Yep, all good. Okay. All right. So, hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction of Jenny. Um, my name is Sam Wilson, and I just and I'm just going to talk about our paper that was recently presented at WACV 2023: Hyperdimensional Feature Fusion for Out of Distribution Detection. Um, with my fellow co-authors, Toby Fisher, Nico Sunderhaf, and Faraz Dayan. Um, we would also like to thank uh, Per Newbert from Chemnitz University of Technology, um, who helped um, my understanding of hyperdimensional computing and um, contributed to some insightful discussions. Uh, just to add a little correction, I'm actually from the um, from Queensland University of Technology, the QUT Centre for Robotics, and Faraz is a representative of the University of Adelaide. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry it, for that. It, it's, it's all good. No, 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 it's all good. That, like, you're maybe a, a, an hour south. Too far. <laughs> yeah. Um, all good. Okay, so motivation. Um, deep neural networks are really, really good at um, the tasks that we train them on. But what we often find is that when the training distribution um, doesn't actually match the testing distribution, we often find that the nail the deep neural networks fail silently, often being very overconfident in their erroneous predictions. So in this example here, you've had a network trained on cars and now you've got a plane coming into the network and it's unfortunately ex exceptionally confident that we now have a limousine. The network just isn't robust to this kind of distributional shift and the features that the network learns are just very bad for this task. Put more succinctly, as my supervisor likes to say, neural networks fail silently on out of distribution samples. Furthermore, in many applications, we find that the neural network as the backbone is often frozen, meaning that we cannot retrain it. This is very, this is very common in large scale applications like ImageNet pre-trained models or in, um, for, in situations where the neural network architecture is very large, like transformer architectures, and it's very computationally expensive to retrain these networks to add in one additional um, one additional edge case. And then every time you need to retrain it for additional edge cases that you encounter throughout your deployment. So this then brings us to the question of, all right, well, if we can't you trust the outputs of the model and our, froze, our features of the network are frozen and we cannot retrain the network, what can we actually do? Well, we can, check the, um, we can check the individual features within the network, so individual layers and see how these activations work. And there's prior work showing that these layers are individually sensitive to different types of OOD data, but there's no principled way of fusing all of these representations together to, um, to detect the ad distribution data while being robust to the layers that are actually quite noisy in the process. So of course, deep neural network features are very high dimensional and we can encounter the curse of dimensionality when inspecting these features. As we, and similarly, we don't know where these best features are a priori. Without actually knowing the OOD data, we don't know what the best features will be. So we need a method to fuse them. For a bit more of concrete motivation, I actually have an image taken from a out of distribution segmentation data set called uh, Fishyscape. So it's a cityscapes train model. And we have a cityscapes scene and a completely missed dog. Like this model is very concretely 93% confident that this dog is perfectly piece of drivable piece of road. So this helps demonstrate the importance of this problem where we, for, to ensure safe and reliable application of these models, we need to be able to detect out of distribution samples and adjust to these accordingly. This is probably quite an expert audience. So I'll just quickly go through the hyperdimensional computing 
fundamentals. So of course, it's a framework for dealing with high dimensional data and associations between the data points that are stored as vectors in associative memory. And we construct this through a set of standardized operations. Of course, we have bundling, which just creates a new representation from multiple inputs, and it retains similarity to all of its inputs. Um, binding combines a set of vectors into a representation that is dissimilar to all its inputs, but of course preserves the similarity of input vectors um, prior to binding. And encoding, which projects data from the original space into the hyperdimensional space. For our specific application, we use a multiply add permute um, hyperdimensional computing framework, just without any of the additional cutting or binarizations that are pre not binarizations, uh, integer rounding or anything similar to that, that that is generally involved with those. We just, for bundling, just raw element-wise addition, binding element-wise multiplication. For encoding, we use an orthogonal projection to the high dimensional space. And for similarity, it's just standard cosine similarity. So in at a very high level, our method is effectively to take input samples as images and use a CNN backbone to extract features from the, uh, as a feature encoder. We then project all of these features up into high dimensional vectors and bundle across them to create a single, to create both class descriptive vectors and image descriptive vectors. In our paper, we have this algorithm here on the right, and I'll actually run through the individual steps here to help um, help everyone understand what we're actually doing in this work. So of course, the very first step is to extract features from the backbone of the neural network. So we have some sample input here. And in this instance, we're just hooking into and taking features from all of the convolutional layers. Next, to actually get them down to, to vector representations, we need to spatially pull them to um, vector representations so that we can then actually incorporate them into our hyperdimensional computing framework. In practice, we use either average or max pooling. Uh, generally, we find that max pooling has slightly better performance than average pooling. Now that we have these fe um, individual feature vectors from different layers, we then orthogonally project them up into the hyperdimensional space so that we now have a set of all of the same size vectors. And then we bundle across every single one of these vectors to create what we describe as an image descriptor vector, which describes the feature state of the network for that individual image. Next, to, next in order for us to create class descriptor vectors, we bundle across all of the image descriptor vectors belonging to a single class label. We then, doing this, creates a single vector that describes the feature state, the standard feature state of the network whenever it encounters an object of this class. Then at test time, we simply just compare the, uh, we compare the, uh, the vector of a new input with any of the class, all of the class descriptor vectors, and we find the one that they are closest to and use our use the angle to the closest vector as our outer distribution score, meaning that higher samples we would expect map further away from, out of the, from the class bundle vectors with in-distribution samples mapping much closer to them. And we see this in practice. So in this figure here, this is one of our first results, we find that the blue and green lines, which are the um, in-distribution training and test sets, so we are calibrating on the train sets, we calibrate our bundles on the training set, and we find that on the x-axis, we find that most of the samples are concentrated in between the 10 to 15, to 10 to 20 degree angle range from the closest bundle, whereas the outer distribution data sets are often quite further away, being about 30 to 40 degrees out, um, with the near outer distribution, the Cypher 100, being a very similar, uh, two very similar data sets, Cypher 10 and Cypher 100, has a bit more of an even spread across the angles, but it's still quite far away. And our results show that um, we outperform most other post hoc um, OOD baselines, which, and we are competitive with the state of the art whilst being about four and a half, at least four and a half times faster during inference and significantly faster during calibration. Um, 
And furthermore, we are also compatible with different training methodologies and other post hoc OOD detectors. As, as in we can feed our um, hyperdimensional image descriptor vectors into additional out of distribution detectors, or we can um, attach our method onto other OOD detectors that require specific training of the network. So we just take a drink. <clears throat> and so importantly, we need to figure out um, is the fusion of these layers, is hyperdimensional computing and fusing all these layers together actually very effective for our task? Are we just going to be losing a bunch of performance due to the really poor performing layers in the network? So we do a quick ablation here with a subset of the out of distribution data sets. So in this setting, Cypher 10 is the in distribution data set and the four lines here are the performance on four of the out of distribution data sets. And as we progress, this is us as we along the x-axis progressively hook into just a single layer of the network. And so as expected, we find that the first couple of layers of the network are often quite poor performing, which we expect when the filters are often just quite simple Gabor filters for the convolutional network. But as we get to further and further through the network, the performance of the layers does get better. But as we can see by these dashed lines at the top, this is at, the dashed lines at the top are the performance of the fusion of all the layers. So we see that these all outperform the individual layer performance and that there's occasional dips at certain, at certain points throughout the network. This behavior is more pronounced in the Cypher 100 data set, but Cypher 10 provides a much cleaner graph to visualize this one. Furthermore, we also find that the samples seem to cluster by visual similarity in the feature space. So for ex this, as an example here, we have um, a bunch of non-cherry picked samples that are approximately similar to the truck class belonging to Cypher 10. So at the very center here, we have um, both near OOD samples and blue ID samples that are exceptionally similar to the truck class. So a fire truck in the middle with the bear, and as we expand further out, we start seeing um, very vehicle-like um, objects appearing. So we have motorbikes, tractors, trucks, and then at the very far beyond 30 degree range, we see images that are very, very dissimilar to the truck class. So we see this clustering behavior in the high dimensional space. Additionally, we can also then compare the similarity of um, inputs and to get a sense of their visual similarity through the deep network. So by just funneling these two into the cosine similarity, we can then compare the similarity of individual samples by their image descriptors. So for an example, we have um, comparisons here where the toads and frogs are very similar to each other. The two cars are very similar to each other, but then conversely, we find that cars are not very visually similar to um, frogs and that cats are not very visually similar to frogs. This is of course subject to the um, features that are actually extracted by the deep neural network, but this still helps us provide a proxy for visual similarity. I've actually gone quite a bit faster than I expected here, so I'm very happy to reiterate things for um, some questions. But to maybe just give a quick summary, um, HDFF is competitive with the state of the art for significantly less computational costs. And the, the fusion of the layer wise descriptor vectors is robust to the noise of the lower performing layers. And furthermore, we can actually interpret the angles between descriptor vectors as visual feature similarity for our purposes. Thank you. Any questions? So let's see. Do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, I think Matthew. Yeah, go on. Hi, can you guys hear me? Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Matthew. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Maryland. I work on uh, reservoir computing and biologically inspired deep learning. And recently I've been dipping into mm -hmm. knowledge prediction and OOD, so this is very interesting. Thank you so much for this talk. Mm -hmm. I just had a couple of questions. I, in my experiments, I've, um, I've noticed that uh, the first question is, the OOD algorithms seem to do really well when you compare against other data sets. 
but within the same data set, that performance seems to seems to change a bit. So, like if you were to test on C four ten and then you know, or train on C four ten and test on you know MNIST, you do it, it does really well. But then if you test on C four ten with you know some digits and then or train with some digits and test on others, it does a bit worse. And or if you have some digits that if you're trying to find much more subtle things. So, have you tried experimenting with this on within the same data set OOD samples? Um, so yes, uh, one important clarification there might be that, so maybe if I just go back to this, uh, let's maybe go back here just for the moment. So yes, you're right. There is a, OOD methods perform well under what we call large, large distributional shifts. Um, but importantly, the specific scenario that you're talking about, um, say if we train on a subset of Cypher 10, um, maybe five classes, and then evaluate trying to detect the other five of the Cypher 10 classes. This is actually a different problem. This is called open set detection. Um, and this, they're basically split based on the size of the distributional shift between the two challenges. Um, open set focuses on problems where you're li very likely to have a good feature set for the detection, whereas out of distribution is much further where your features can't even be guaranteed to be matching to the um, distributional shift. So in this case of Cypher to MNIST, you can't even, you can't really say much about how well the features actually, uh, the features learned in Cypher 10 will translate over to MNIST. Whereas in, if you've got five, five Cypher classes and then the other five, you can at least be reasonably sure that there's not a massive distributional shift between the two. And so your features learnt on one subset will likely translate over to the other in some method. Um, I've got a colleague actually at my lab that works on the open set problem. So I'm happy to talk more about this if you like. Yeah, th 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 thank you for clarifying that. I, I must, if it was a mistake on my part to not have that distinction. So that, 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 that actually helps frame some of the algorithms performance that I've seen before. And then another quick question, if you have time, do you have any intuitions yeah. for why expanding into a hyperdimensional space does any like like helps with this um, out of distribution um, problem? Like, does, does something about the the higher space give give you any benefits? So, in our application, we use the higher space as effectively just used to aggregate the data across the different layers. So you know, if you extract features from layer one of the network, they're 256 dimensional, if they're two, they're 512, three, 1024, et cetera. Um, so we need them all to be put into one unified space, which is why we use this orthogonal projection up to the higher dimensions. I see, I see. The, in, in terms of why this actually improves the ad distribution detection performance, there's been some prior work in OOD literature that shows that the final layer of the network is often very unreliable and that for individual OOD data sets, the best, there's often a best layer in the network, but it's not consistent across data sets. So we use this fusion um, to ensure robustness across all of these data sets so that we can effectively get some of the best information from each of the data sets. It might be a bit clearer here. So if we look at the green line here, for example, you can see that um, layer nine is by far the best performing. It's got a much higher performance gap um, on layer nine, but it still doesn't quite reach the performance of the fusion. But for layer nine for the other data sets is not actually the best performing layer. It's often layer 11 is the better performing of the bunch. So by fusing across all the layers, we end up with a nice noise, a nice fusion that's robust to the noise from these poor performing layers. I, I see that. Th thank you. That, that explains quite a bit. No worries. Uh, no, then um, we have Jeff. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> uh, Samuel. Thanks for your talk. Um, I you you yeah. sort of uh, wisely brushed through a lot of the VSA details. Um, I wonder if you could. Uh, I do have some questions um, with your your particular VSA. Um, so mm -hmm. it's uh, the real vectors. This is not yes, HR. Completely right? real. This is, um, <clears throat> okay, and so you use. No, uh, uh, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, this is the MAP uh, multiplier per mu. Okay. <clears throat> um, so in the binding, you just, it's element wise multiplication. And um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the unbinding would just be element wise division. Yes. And there's no normalization of these vectors. So you just, you just multiply, multiply, multiply. No. So um, it's not, it's not in the paper, but we did um, personally experiment with um, map C, map, um, map I, uh, and I don't remember what the specific acronym for normalization is, but we did experiment with those. Um, and we just find that they, the performance difference it's, isn't massive, but it's a couple of less than 1% difference, but it's often not, it's not in favor of performance by adding these extra normalization steps, which I yeah. would assume is primarily just due to the nature of deep neural networks since they're not bounded by any of these hyperdimensional computing rules. Right. Okay. Maybe, I, maybe I can answer the question uh, of my own. Sorry, Ross, uh, just one uh, short question before I uh, give a mic to you. Um, I, um, you. Can you maybe you go to the slide where you actually do use binding? Because uh, if I remember correctly, you just uh, superimpose uh, the descriptors of the layers uh, into one bundle. Yes, yeah, so this was a, a bit brushed over in the talk. Um, so in maybe it's better if I go to one of these slides and can I draw very quickly? Um, so in the very end step of our algorithm, we have this at the very bottom left here, which is um, ah. which is actually what uses the binding. So we only use binding if in the situation where you have an ensemble of models in the for the app distribution detection. So if you have five models, you then inst instantiate a random vector for each of those models and then bind the output image descriptors to all oh, yeah. of those yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. bundle across guess, them to yeah. aggregate in a principal way. It's just that in the description here, it's a bit, it gets a bit muddled if you start then talking about doing this across multiple deep but ensembles then, uh, and then adding everything together. Mm -hmm. But just to increase my understanding, so uh, uh, but this means that you need to somehow binarize uh, the um, weight vectors, or uh, you 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 have this projection step, right? So that you kind yes. of map to to integers. Why would I need to binarize? Sorry. No, but uh, I mean, so the the vectors say uh, from the convolutional layers, uh, so the, the they're real numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you need to, um, so you say that uh, you use like integer vectors or what? what uh, so integer. we just use real number vectors. Uh, real number vectors, okay. Because if you do so, then binding normally could, uh, could be implemented differently, uh, like uh, with a circle convolution. I mean, yeah, at least oh, it could, it could be true. Yes, um, we, we so we didn't go too far into checking different um, VSAs. Uh, we did actually test uh, HRR, HRR um, by adding mm -hmm. uh, by changing the orthogonal projection to a projection based. It was projection then followed by a fast Fourier transform. Uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. to create the vectors and again we saw a small performance drop but not massive the, generally when we substituted out the vsa we found pretty consistent performance across it's just that keeping all the numbers in their original state was the most most high performing state there was so the, the intuitive answer seemed to work slightly better hmm. um, in this situation yeah um, um yeah uh, thanks. Uh, maybe maybe I can uh, give a mic to to Ross at this point. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the the talk, Sam. Actually, I'll just uh, if you indulge me for a minute, I'll just uh, mm -hmm. actually make a comment to Jeff uh, Orchard. Uh, Jeff, you're talking about uh, you made a quick passing reference to uh, unbinding in map being element wise uh, division. Uh, but in fact, um, MAP and uh, Penti's binary spatter code are multiplicatively self-inverse. So the way you unbind is to just bind again. 
with the same thing. Uh, and that's because and this actually then leads back to uh, the comment that uh, Evgeny was making, that um, the way you can think of the numbers, the elements in, in MAP is uh, think of them as a special case of complex values. And so uh, the sign is the phase, which has been just binarized to two values. And then the magnitude is the magnitude of the, uh, of the complex vector. So that's something that uh, Tiny Plate pointed out a gazillion years ago. Um, so it's, uh, you just think of, it as a, think of them as a special case of uh, complex valued uh, binding. But yeah, so they, um, you need to have that property of um, essentially the, the phase being discretized to two levels to get the self inverse property. Otherwise, uh, you, you get into the normal mode of um, the unbinding being a separate operation. Anyway, yeah, um, uh, <laughs> to get back to the, the points, I actually was a, a couple of questions for, for Sam. Sam, you talked about calibration. Can I get you to uh, tell me what you were doing there? Uh, and then I'll go on to another, okay. another point. So calibration, I just, by calibration, I just mean this um, phase of formulating the class bundle descriptor vectors. So this entire diagram here, oops, this entire set of slides, okay, my slides are now not moving, sorry. Let's back around about the one where you had all the distributions. Oh no, okay. Oh, sorry, this one. Here. Oh no no no! You you explain it the way you want to. Right? That's don't 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 project is my this... misunderstanding of things. That's the one where I thought you were talking the... about calibration, but yes. Yeah, so I when I say calibration phase, so we have for the deep neural network, we have the training phase where you actually train yep. the deep neural network, and then in OOD detectors, you can sometimes have a calibration phase, which is what we do. This is our formulation of the class descriptor vectors. So actually formulating, bundling across all of these layers across the training set to create these individual class representative vectors is what we call our calibration phase. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, calibration so, yeah. is a, you know, as a term is just used all over the place to mean different things. So I wasn't, I wasn't sure what you meant by calibration there. Okay, final. Yeah, yeah. sorry final, for the confusion. No, 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 no. Final real point. <laughs> um, so one of your graphs, you were talking about um, the, the y-axis on a graph was um, uh, area under the curve. And uh, yes. I, I'm presuming that's a multi-class area under the curve. Uh, no, binary. So what the way we work in our distribution detection is effectively you get score, you get an ID in distribution testing set, out of distribution testing set. Yeah. You calculate scores across all of them and you consider these two, two individual classes. So, oh, okay. so zeros for in distribution, one out of distribution. Okay, so you're just discriminating between in and out of distribution. Yes, it's just a binary classification okay. problem. Okay. All right, because the because uh, later on when you were talking about uh, frogs and uh, cats and cars and so on, uh, at that point there I was thinking, oh yeah, multi-class um, classification, uh, which so, then because I'd sort of presumed that you're using multi-class uh, area under the curve. Uh, was then leading me to um, to another point about um, in multi-class AUC, the way it's the way it's often calculated is effectively as a, an average AUC across pairs of classes, uh, which I think most people don't actually go away and look at the pairs of classes, but it does give you you, know, you do have a a measure at that level. So you know when you were going to these questions of why is it doing this and and you know is it able to tell the difference between the frog and the cat and so on, then having that um, pair class-wise uh, AUC uh, could be an interesting um, interesting tool to help you look in more detail at what it knows and what it doesn't know. Yeah, and, and so there's been a, I, I fully agree with what you're saying, and thank you for um, clearing that up. I'm, I always use AU rock in a binary sense, so I sometimes yeah. entirely forget that it can be used in a multi-class sense, but. Um, but yeah, so it, the figure you're specifically talking about is this one here, where we have all yep. these um, sim visual similarities here. Um, yeah, and so you're are absolutely right. Uh, degrees, aren't they? Yes, of course they are. Because yes, so they're degrees. Yeah. 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 So we our my argument with this is only a small observation in our paper, just because yeah. it's 
a bit underexplored in terms of saying that you can get visual similarity from a network is a bit of a sensitive topic. Um, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so the got... only difference between that, so there you've got the separation and effectively that'll be a mean separation. So that's, if you like, uh, uh, the difference between the mean angle, you know, the mean directions of the, uh, the distributions corresponding to each of those uh, classes or, or images. Um, mm -hmm. If you had something like a, an AUC um equivalent of that number instead of having the the degrees the thing that would the the difference would be that that would scale that difference relative to uh the uh the standard deviations of those uh, of the underlying distributions so it, it tells you mm -hmm. how far apart they are uh, relative to the variability within those distributions Ah, yep. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're meaning. Yes. So uh, yes, yeah. I fully agree with that. Could you, this is a weird, weird, potentially weird question just on that thought. So you're basically saying that you could almost parameterize this in some manner of a, you've got this mean descriptor vector and then a parameterization based on the variance of the angle? Uh, yeah, anything, anything that uh, is to do with AUC is based mm -hmm. on comes out of signal detection theory and the underlying conceptual model there is that uh, what you're doing is you're comparing distributions uh, so to each of your classes that you're in you're trying to detect there's an underlying distribution of something or other and so uh, the um, sensible signal detection theory uh, measures of discriminability of classes reduced to something related to what's the difference between the location in the classes uh, somehow or other scaled relative to the variability within the classes. Um, yeah. So uh, if, if you think of any of these you know, boxes that you've got here as representing a class and that you have uh, a distribution of images which give you a distribution of corresponding representational vectors, then it might be just a better way of uh, of, of doing the analysis in that you know you can have two classes which are the same uh, angular separation but if they mm -hmm. have a much higher internal variability then it might mean that they're actually much less separable in practice mm, yeah okay that, that's very depends, interesting it depends on the degree us. of it depends on the degree of overlap yeah. if there's no overlap then it really doesn't it doesn't matter how much internal yeah, this, variability there is <laughs> but, yeah, sorry that's just yeah. me wandering off into a side alley there uh so I'll, I'll but it's a very good point thank you point. you're welcome sam i i this is fritz i have also two quick questions so one is so you use for the encoding you use a just a linear matrix this orthogonal projection that's just linear or yes what, uh, it, yeah yeah it's a have linear semi-orthogonal matrix i see so but if you project and you but in this projects up to a higher dimensional space for some of the layers, is that right? Yes. Um, have you thought about other encoding methods where you use the space more efficiently? Because of course, if you use a linear matrix to project a lower dimensional space up, you're still just using a subspace in the higher dimensional space. So it's not really an ideal way to do distributed coding of that lower dimensional manifold in a way. Yes, you're absolutely right. And this is more or less the core concept that we built upon that the idea is that we wanted to ensure that at the very least, all of the individual layers were sufficiently separated because what we wanted to avoid was effective. So each of these layers are given well, an individual orthogonal so, so projection. So you wanted to use different so, subspaces in the HD space for the different layers, rather than really do yes. distributed coding, which is usually the philosophy in, in HD, so that you really, I see. So you, you really keep those, I see, okay. And then the second question is, you use kind of the bundling for forming these glass vectors, mm -hmm. right? Now, I mean, coming from signal detection theory, that's not the optimal way to do it. So it would be better to use kind of to, to form a glass vector using, for example, a pulse perceptron learning or something like that. Have, have you experimented with something like this? Sorry, did you say positron learning there? 
Perceptron. The Perceptron? Positron. No, not Perceptron. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar, sorry. Oh, I, I see. That's just a, it's an old neural network model. Perceptron, and, um, right? Yeah, and so it's so oh, a perceptron. Learning, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so the learning um, that's kind of a different way to form these class vectors, and it's more efficient. It it gets you kind of better performances in the classification than just so, summing them up. So using a perceptron to manipulate the space, and then um, using the per with... the perceptron learning rule, just the perceptron learning rule. So you form this mm -hmm. is kind of a nonlinear and error based way how to actually sum. It's not just a summation of the of the individual mm -hmm. class member vectors, and it leads to um, better. So yeah, it leads to better performance in the in the linear classification that you're doing later. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think I've gotten what you're saying that so it's better to use this more principled manner of nonlinear effectively nonlinear projection that's learnt to um to do this linear classific or to do this classification afterwards is that a exactly so it's another way to, but quite, yes yeah it's another way to form the the class vector which is a little which is more, i mean it, it it requires of course supervised learning but then it works better than just summing them up what you do in the bundling yeah okay so uh, i have a bit of an answer to this um so i have another paper currently under review so i can't exactly just advertise it right now um that we do actually do something quite similar to that so what we find is that this sort of method works perfectly fine for classification where there's quite a nice cosine separation of the individual classes in the feature space. But when you scale this up to something like object detection or segmentation, the um, these classes end up overlapping each other if you just use a simple linear projection. So in our subsequent work, we've actually um, done a bit of training with a little MLP perceptron that um, projects them up to a higher space, and then we can classify for them for a for this harder task and it actually ends up with a lot better separation there okay does that help answer it's just not it's yeah. not considered in this work but we do consider I something so. quite i mean you could just do it here work. you could just um i mean without doing anything more fancy with multi-layer per perceptrons you could just here replace the bundling by uh supervised lo per per perceptron learning just mm -hmm. one layer uh, that's there's a no yeah so so that's that a that good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, Ross, you uh, yeah. raise the hand. Yes, again. sorry. I'm just um, following on from what uh, Fritz said there. Uh, given that earlier on uh, you were saying that uh, it appeared that one of the, the problem with uh, the deep learning uh, appeared to arise in the last layer. So if you took the view that all the preceding layers were effectively calculating features, uh, then perhaps you, you think of the last layer as actually being the supervised learning from the mm -hmm. features to the class labels. I wonder, it'd be interesting to compare that with what uh, Fritz was just suggesting in the use of supervised learning in the summarization of individual feature layers. Uh, maybe it's the case that uh, uh, just just worth investigating whether it's actually the the supervised learning part, the optimization with respect to an objective, which, which is the cause of the, uh, the the fragility to to out of distribution. And you know, maybe maybe optimizing it actually makes it too tuned to specifically what you've got, <laughs> rather than just being generically okay at most things. Uh, so I, mean, I think that would be worth looking at because i think you know obviously an, an aim of this is to try to work out why is it that this performs better than vanilla deep networks at this kind of task yeah that's a, i can actually give you a little if, if you care i can actually give you little hints that have um existed it, that exist in literature um from previous studies basically we have two two core attributes seem to be contributing to this primarily um 
The first is just softmax. If you're doing any sort of classification task and you use softmax, the network almost always becomes overconfident in the in distribution data. You need to, if you train without softmax and try to use some other losses um, for the classification or do it off raw features, it generally helps improve the outer distribution detection quite a bit. Um, and the second is batch normalization. Uh, batch normalization on outer distribution data because of the mismatch between the features often triggers very abnormally high reactions in the normalized features. And then those get propagated through the network to create further and further abnormally high activations, which eventually ends up with all of the, um, all of the probability that it gets expressed in the softmax in the end being expressed in one single node. Um, as a, at a very high level, there's a few, a few papers investigating the entire effects that are propagated throughout the network from these, but softmax and batch norm are actually two of the very large contributors to this problem. Okay, thank you. Inverse, in, inversely, shortcut connections uh, are one of the <clears throat> enable, enablers in, in improving OOD detection performance. Uh, Donny and then Panty. Hi, Tony. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. No. Mm, not yet. No. Mm -mm. Now let me see if you're... Mm. Uh, maybe we can continue with Panty so while uh, uh, Tony is rebooting. One does a zoom. Okay, so th this is a good picture to have. First, first of all, it, do I understand right that you you have these uh, things that are vertical in here? They are the new. No, which which one is the source? And no, the arrows go from the vertical ones to the big horizontal. So the big horizontal, does it sort of represent some high dimensional vector? So this orange rectangle in the middle here? Yeah, the orange in the middle, yeah. Yeah, so this is just to represent a, a function basically. So this is the orthogonal projection. We have okay. an individual okay. matrix instantiated yeah. for each layer and then we multiply. A couple of that. things that, that may, <clears throat> may, may um, help is first of all, if you, just simply use, instead of orthogonal projection, if you just use random projection, I don't know if it makes any difference, but the thing is that just project the very high dimensional space. And that, mm -hmm. I think that has the property though, because of, in, a, in a very high dimensional space, you have more corners in some sense. Mm -hmm. And so things that, things that were hard to separate before become linearly separable. So you may you may gain linear separability just just by blowing up the dimensionality, like in a thou yeah. the thousands. I don't know if it if it generalizes. I mean, you can separate your training set better, but whether it generalizes to to a, a test set, I I don't know. And the other thing is what you can do is is uh, and this is sort of related to what Fritz said. That using uh, using the perceptron, you can also you can also do it just instead of instead of simply just adding. That you also include a multi a sort of vectors that are sort of just multiplying pairwise vectors, and and include those, and and because the multiplication operation it it means that now you are doing something nonlinear, and when mm -hmm. you do something nonlinear, it may again in a high demand, it may, may result in something that gets linearly separable that was not, not before. So those are just some basic tricks to try. And I haven't tried them. So I'm just talking of sort of <laughs> theoretically, but, but I think you are doing all these tests. So, so, you know, just try them. Let us know what happens. Okay. So I can I can at least tell you what happens with the first one. Um, okay. But so thank you thank you for both of those suggestions. So the first one, um, just instantiating a random matrix. So first maybe a clarification. We're projecting to a ten thousand dimensional space. So okay. Ni nice and big. 
Um, the orthogonal projection uh, is following a method from a paper which guarantees that um, it's completely orthogonal along the mm -hmm. rows and columns. But um, if we instantiate a random matrix, like a, a um, if we use a Gaussian to um, instantiate random weights for a matrix and then project up there, we find that they this is effectively a orthogonal transform anyway. Um, yeah, right. If you take so it's I think it's the difference between ninety de guaranteed ninety degrees or eighty nine point four degrees was one of the experiments that we got. So. Close enough. Effectively the same effect. It doesn't change. It doesn't change yeah. anything in the raw numbers. It's just the orthogonal projections slightly more theoretically grounded um, there by saying, yes, it's guaranteed to be 90 degrees. Um, but the, yes, a random matrix works perfectly fine. Um, this second point about um, binding and bundling, I haven't experimented with that, but I quite appreciate that. Thank you. Um, some nonlinear transforms of the space might help um, might help make these classes a bit more separable in the future space. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's try Tony again. Okay, can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, uh, now, yes. Okay, okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for this talk, Sam. Very interesting stuff. I had a couple of, I feel like I'm um, now harping on what Fritz and, <laughs> and Pinky were saying, but about the, um, this this the projection. Can you flick back to the slide that was magenta in color? It also had the projection, but it had the this one. Yeah, yeah, that one. The spatial pooling. Um, yeah. Yes. So I was thinking, like what Fritz was saying, that when you if you do a linear projection from your lower dimensional up to your higher dimensional space, you don't actually sort of give yourself any more dimensions to play with. Um, yeah. But if you could do a uh, basically a, a nonlinear projection there, but you know, that's essentially expanding out your space that might help. It seems like the, the, the way you're talking, your final dimension is 10,000 that you're, that mm -hmm. you're pooling in. What, what's the dimensionality of the layers that you're projecting from? Uh, so they range from 128 up to 2048. Right. Okay. Or the orders of two. Double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking that the ones of 128, that's when because you're you are bundling your examples to to sort of make these exemplars. Is that correct? So you you're calculating yes. averages. Yeah, yeah. And so the I, what I've noticed is in in um in you know like in just moderate sized dimensionality spaces like you know on the order of hundred or so. The, the averaging, it can pretty quickly turn things to mush if you, if you have much diversity. But if you have more, it, when you have more dimensions, it can, it can represent more information there. And, and I've, I've tried some experiments with something like this where just using some pretty simple nonlinear projections. And basically, you just calculate an outer product. If you have 100, 128 dimensional vector, just calculate the the outer product of that. That gives you 128 times 128. So that's like over 10,000. And then you can project that to whatever dimensionality you want, and you've got a, a nonlinear spreading random projection. Right. So, well, you could also use random Fourier features, for example. I mean, like like Tony Blade's old idea of this exponentiation of complex vectors. Because I also think you want to spread out rather than having now different subspaces, different kind of um, components that only see, uh, you know, uh, see, for example, now encoded things from convolutional layer one, you want to spread out each convolutional layer in an entirely 10,000 dimensional vector evenly before you do the superposition, because otherwise you have certain sectors in the vector that might crowd much more than others and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the sort of thing mm -hmm. I, was, I was speaking of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree, yeah. Tony. Yeah, exactly. That's... Yeah, yeah, and then and then my other question was when I see this, this really reminds me of um, similar ideas that in in two tower networks, two tower encoder networks. I, I wonder if you have you um have you looked at those at all and the 
with whether there are any relationships? Um, so the second question can just be easy answered. No, we haven't. Um, we haven't okay. really quite made that link, but could you describe the link a bit more, please? And just Yeah, yeah. So two tower networks, what people do is have if they have two very if they have two different modalities of input mm -hmm. and what they want to do is is learn so like images and text have one network that's encoding up to you know some you know so if you've got a an image you know it's your your um your your it, it's a large matrix encode to yeah, you know, 128, 128 dimensional um network or whatever, um, you know, just layer. And then from text, the text description of the of an image, you encode to to a to something in and what you try to do is get encodings to go to the same space by using yep, so clip clip. So clip for again. an example. Yes. So clip based models. I'm not I'm not familiar with that term. <laughs> Oh, so Clip is uh, it's Open AI. Um, so they they actually have this really large pre-trained model that maps these um, images to um, and yeah. images and text yeah. encodings to the same embedding space. Yeah. Okay. So I just didn't know the terminology. Uh, two tower yeah. models. Yeah. Yeah. So the two it's like because it's it's like two towers, and then and then what people try to do is to get it to go to the same space, and that's sort of similar to what you're doing here. You've got if you've got 11 networks here then you can think of it as 11 different things that you're that you're sort of putting into the same space but but that's what i and then and then people use just a, a cosine to to measure the similarity in that space and so that's where i was seeing the similarities yeah i i would see similarities if uh, so I see where similarities you're going for, and I, I think I agree for the most part. I think maybe a key difference here is that we're not actually trying to learn with all of these hyperdimensional vectors. We're assuming that everything's fixed um, prior to our prior to us actually applying our method. So we're not optimizing for any sort of um, cosine similarity with any additional modality of data that these hyperdimensional vectors are just effectively a, a representation yeah. of the feature space rather than being learned to yeah. summarize any individual. Yeah, yeah, you're just range. trying to you're just trying to use them rather than modify them. Yes, but if we if we were to incorporate them somehow into the training procedure, then yes, I think yeah. that would be quite a close link there. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could you could view your projection as the place where you could do the training. Mm, yes, that's true. And that's what, um, what's been spoken about by Fritz earlier about the perceptron learning for the projection as well as the yep. um, image descriptive vectors. Yep, yep. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I want thank to you. add uh, one comment. Uh, so I put a reference in the chat, uh, which uh, okay. in my opinion, Kind of closely related to what you do, uh, but also uh, I reacted on what Penty said about uh, um, linear separability. So this is rather theoretical uh, kind of mathematical paper from 2016. So they also use um, representations from hidden layers uh, to, mm -hmm. well, in their case, to correct errors. Uh, so of uh, of a classifier, but I mean maybe you can have a look if you're interested uh, uh, in some um, mathematical foundations of this uh, separability uh, in high dimensional spaces. Yeah, no, thank you. I'll take a look. Uh, then Jeff uh, posted a comment in the chat as well. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Uh, sure. I. I'm just reacting to um, <clears throat> um, the comment um, <clears throat> about pro a cross product between two 128 dimensional vectors uh, opening up to like 10,000 dimensional space, but uh, I, maybe my arithmetic's wrong. Um, wouldn't that still just be a 256 dimensional manifold in that space? I, I mean, yeah, I think that was my comment. No, yeah. No, right. I was. It would be sixteen, sixteen k, sixteen thousand, because the 
it you know it's a, it's like a the, the the product is a is a matrix with it's 128 on each side but it's still being constructed using 256 numbers so it would still be like it would still exist within a 256 dimensional manifold would it not it's like it's like taking an outer product between two vectors is still a, a, you know a, a rank one matrix mm. I'm not not that you're suggesting uh, rank one um, products, but uh, oh no, you are. So you are suggesting that outer product, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just the yeah, just the outer product. Um, yeah, it's good a, question. I I think it. I'll have to anyway, test exactly what yeah. I want from it and if it gives it, but I think it does give you. You know that it spreads things out into the into the you know the the quadratically larger space. Yeah, it'd be interesting to to investigate. Anyway, it was a bit of a technical sort of uh, issue. Thank you. So let me check. Yeah, are there uh, any more questions? I think we had a exciting discussion. Uh, today, no, I'm very happy with the number of questions. Uh, sure, I mean, and uh, I mean, uh, so uh, please join us more so for this kind of discussion. So I'm very pleased with today's webinar. All right, uh, so let's see. Uh, so last uh, chance to ask questions. Well, if no, then I would like to thank you all for attending uh, today's webinar. Maybe as a very, very last word, I want to um, remind you, and uh, in a couple of weeks, I will seriously spend time on planning and uh, notifying you, but uh, uh, the week with 15th and 16th of June, so uh, we are organizing a midnight sun workshop here in northern Sweden. Uh, uh, dedicated to vector symbolic architectures and hyperdimensional computing. So please uh, plan for coming. So I would like to welcome you here. But um, for now, I say thank you and uh, goodbye. See you in two weeks from now. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Sam. Thanks, everybody. Bye.